that you've seen here, and uh, they they now sell this in the bookstore. Apparently, they've they've put it on their website, and so they're starting to get a lot more orders for it. So they've just asked us to reorder it. Uh, we're still in the process of of uh, working up the final pain poster, and uh, we're we're still discussing with them which poster they want. But uh, based on, on all of the previous uh, pictures that I'd shown you, and also some of the verbal descriptions of pain and the death mask, um, my brother, uh, his name is Rob Edwards, by the way, he came up with a composite that, that probably is our best estimate of what he might have looked like. And of course, there's an art to this as well as a, a little bit of science. So. Uh, and the portrait that we've come up with is shown here on the computer screen um, that I uh, that you took a, an image of earlier. Now this one has some uh, writing over it. That was a style that the uh, the buyer at the museum liked. So this will it will probably look somewhat like this. And uh, so this is the this is the young revolutionary pain. This is a more lifelike pain. Your brother has rendered him in a very uh, debonair fashion, I must say. <laughs> we think he was a uh, he was a he was a revolutionary, a radical, but also a a very humane person, a humanist in the truest sense, and uh, very compassionate. and uh, And he had the fire and the will and the strength to to do some of the most amazing writing that's ever that's ever been written. I think in English. Can you explain deism a bit for our viewers? Because I think many would characterize pain by today's standards as a deist. Yes. And explain what that entails and why, even in that day and age, being a deist was so at odds with uh, at least <laughs> prevailing mores uh, in the United States. I think. Uh I, I'm not sure how he arrived at his deism. He, his father was a Quaker, and when he grew up, certainly they felt a little repression from the other uh, Protestant uh, sects. And uh, he he knew he knew something. He knew quite a bit actually about religion. But I think his approach to religion, as I mentioned before, was um, almost childlike. He would look at it, you know, standing back. What does this look like? And he would ask some basic questions. And uh, one of the questions he asked is, um, what should I believe and on what authority? And he said, uh, if, I, if somebody, if God reveals something to me, that's a revelation to me directly. If, it, if he reveals something to you, that's a revelation to you. But if you tell me God told you something, that's hearsay because that's you telling me this. And so I have no obligation to believe it. And uh, and so I think is if you take that and apply it, say to the Bible, the Bible is hearsay because the Bible is someone saying God told me to say this. And uh, so if you start to look at that, and then he started looking at the logic of the Bible. You know, what kind of a person would uh, kill somebody else to avenge somebody else? And he started looking at these things and said, you know, these are. These are the uh, morality of, of uh, centuries ago. We're we're far beyond this now. So I think his his uh, his idea was just starting to look at things logically and see where it leads. And I think where it led him is is that the only revelation is either directly from a god or else the revelation is nature. And so for him, he believed in a god, but his god was uh, the god that. That provided nature, and uh, he had, he he could not see uh, where people would come from if there wasn't a god. And I think that uh, uh, or nature, where those things would come from. So I think his idea was yes, there's a god because some somebody or something had to make all this stuff, but you can't tell much beyond that except from nature itself. And so I think that was his uh, basic belief. And in fact. Part of his reason for writing Age of Reason, supposedly, was to uh, to combat what he thought was the excesses of atheism in the French Revolution. And uh, he thought the French Revolution was throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And uh, so, so partly he was he was trying to do it for a religious reason, but it was a different religion than than many Christians held to. 
I was reading the last portion of The Age of Reason before leaving home today to come to the studio, and I was struck by a line which is now clarified for me somewhat by your mentioning that Paine's father was a Quaker. Because in the last few pages of the book, Paine mentions that all these Christian sects have persecuted except for the Quakers. Uh -huh, yes. And the reason though, interestingly, the reason he cites as being the reason that the Quakers do not persecute is because he doesn't mention the fact that they're generally just a very small, small sect, mm -hmm. but he says they're basically really deists because they really don't care that much about Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is in their mythology, but not really occupying a central role the way it is in the other sects. I thought that was of interest. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know a lot about the Quakers, but I've met a few, and uh, one of them, in fact, I met at the Atheist Center in Vijayawada, India. And, really? Uh, you know, I knew that the Quakers were, were actively participating in, in the peace movement during the Vietnam War. And uh, I know that, uh, that some of them, like uh, this, this particular individual, uh, he, he looks at, you know, what, is, what can we do that's good for humanity? And if he says, sees someone else doing it, atheist or not, uh, he'll go along with them. And so he, he goes to the Atheist Center, he supports them, he helps them, and, uh, because they're doing good work. And so he's, a lot of the Quakers that I've seen, they're more interested in doing good works. And I think that, uh, of course, Paine did have his differences with the Quakers at the beginning of the Revolution because uh, Quakers had, had commented on common sense that, uh, you know, we, shouldn't, we should respect the king and, and this sort of thing. And he has, a, he has a rebuttal to them that's just phenomenal. But, uh, so he didn't always agree with them, but I think that he did learn some, some basic uh, moral precepts from them that were useful for the rest of his life. There's a quote from Paine, and it adorns some building somewhere, and I think if I have it right verbatim, it, it simply says, the world is my country, to do good is my religion. That's right, and that's right from the Age of Reason. <laughs> that's the opening remarks in the Age of Reason. There's a great preface that Paine writes, uh, too, in which he says, I hope that you will all do me, I mean, I'm not quoting him exactly right, right, but I hope you will do me the service of, of allowing me to speak my mind, knowing that I have always stood for everyone else's right to voice their opinion, however different it might be from my own. And, that, and he follows that with a quotation that, uh, that I thought was one of the best logic, and we put it on the poster, as a matter of fact. And uh, again, I can't quote it directly, but it said something to the effect that uh, um, he who denies the other uh, right to his own opinions uh, denies himself the, the, the right to change his own opinion. And uh, so, of course, we need to allow people to have different opinions and uh, so that we can all enjoy changing our minds sometimes. Well, and on that note, we're going to have to end it, John, and it's a, a perfect message <laughs> to leave our viewers with because it really stands as a statement of this program. I want to thank John Edwards very much for being here, and we're going to have you back soon, John. Oh, thank to you. Talk about some more of your work. Always enjoy coming. Thank you very much, thank and you. we will be back next time on STUN. Thank you very much for joining us, and uh, remember, Mark Twain always said that sacred cow makes the best hamburger, so join us here because you're <laughs> going to find a lot of sacred cows slaughtered, and if, if that <laughs> statement offends uh, vegetarians or nonviolent people, I'm sorry, but take it as a metaphor. <laughs> I'm Lauren Peck. I'm the producer of a Superstition Talking Snakes on Just Texas Nonsense.